So if you need a little bit more time to write before I start speaking, so if not very many people have gotten a chance to write down what's in black and fill in the answer they think is right, then just pause it and give people time some work and then to work and then you can press um, play again. What we're looking at in this journal entry, and I realize that this is not the right journal number, and the two classes are off a little bit, so just whichever one is next, fill that one in. Um, what this is looking about is a disease called sickle cell anemia, and the woman's father had sickle cell, but the woman has no symptoms. And that's what's going to be really important here, is that she doesn't have any symptoms, she's not sick, but um, the man, and so that's kind of taking care of the woman, and then the man's sister has sickle cell, and so does his mom, but he has no symptoms. And so what this is kind of giving us an idea of is they might not have symptoms, but they might still be hiding the trait. The thing here is that this trait, sickle cell, isn't actually recessive. It's actually um, co-dominant. And so what we have to look at is that in co-dominant, you have some sickle cells and some normal. So when the pattern here is co-dominant, they're both present in the bloodstream. However, a heterozygote like SN might will not show any symptoms. So they appear to be a carrier symptomatically, because they don't have any symptoms, but when I look at their blood, I can actually see some normal and some sickle cells. So um, if the woman here does not have symptoms, but her dad had it, then her dad had to be SX, right? Her dad had to be sickle, sickle. So if her dad had to be sickle, sickle, that means she has to have one normal to have no symptoms and one sickle. Same thing with this guy's mom. His mom has to have a normal, uh, I'm sorry, his mom has to be sickle, sickle. So he's an X. So then we fill out the Punnett square. N X cross with N X. And as we fill out our Punnett square, we see that there's a chance they'll have a full normal child, a 50% chance they have heterozygous, and then a 25% chance that their child would have all sickle cells. And so the last part here is a question for you to answer. If you knew there was a one in four chance that your child would be very, very ill from the moment they were born, would this discourage you from having children? And so what we're going to do now is go to our notes on page 61. If you need a little bit more time to get this copy down, then just pause the video and then play it again when we get to the notes on 61. These notes are on genetic disorders. And so on page 61, what we've got are some notes about some different forms of human diseases. And we've already talked about them a little bit, but here's where we're going to really get into the detail about what is that disease. The first disease is called Huntington's. It is a genetic disease. So this is a gene. We need to add the word gene in here. This is a gene found on the fourth chromosome. And it causes the brain to break down which results in loss of muscle coordination. And, but here's the interesting thing. The symptoms don't appear until you're in your 40s. And in your 40s, you've already done lots of things, but one of them is you might have already had children. Have you already had children? And did you pass on that gene? So sometimes you don't even know you have it. You have children, and then you pass on the gene. And the other problem is, is that this is an example of a dominant trait. So the pattern of inheritance, that means that Huntington's would get a capital letter and normal gets the recessive letter. So this means that people who are homozygous dominant have the disease and people
people who are heterozygous have the disease. Again, pause at any time if you need to. The next disease is called sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is when there's something wrong with a protein and the red blood cell doesn't form the right shape. It leads to poor circulation, so low oxygen, and pain because of clotting. These sickle cells will actually clot a lot easier. The pattern of inheritance is actually co-dominant. means that both versions are equally dominant, and so we have, like we saw in the journal Normal Normal, Normal Sickle, and Sickle Sickle. But the heterozygote doesn't have any symptoms. We did also talk about the heterozygote being resistant to malaria, and that's why we see this disease in African American populations, as well as in Africa and in South America and other equatorial regions. Next we've got um, notes on another disease called cystic fibrosis, increased mucus in the lungs and the digestive tract. This pattern is going to be autosomal, recessive, and it actually affects mostly Caucasians. It's a mutation that arose in Europe, in a German population. Um, what we need to know is that cystic fibrosis would get a lower letter, and normal would get a capital letter, whichever letter it was. So anytime we're working cystic fibrosis problems, we know it's what we see with Tay-Sachs is that Tay-Sachs, and so here's a picture of the mucus building up in this person's left lung. Um, Tay-Sachs is actually a genetic disease that leads to breakdown of the brain, but they usually die before they're age two. It is a recessive, so we would give a lowercase letter to the recessive allele. It is found in certain populations because it did arise in a Dutch um, mutation, and it's actually found in Jewish as well, Jewish uh, populations as well. The fifth one here is an interesting one that we've mentioned a little bit before um, because it can actually be controlled by diet. Phenoketonuria, or PKU, is a recessive genetic disease. So what you don't have to do is spend a lot of time memorizing the names and the symptoms as much as you need to be able to assign the correct alleles. What happens with PKU is I can't break down a certain amino acid and that can lead to brain damage. But if it's just one thing that I can't break down, then I just avoid eating that amino acid. So a lot of foods will have a warning label near the ingredients. If they contain phenylalanine, there'll be a warning that says, warning, phenylketonuriacs, this contains phenylalanine. And so what happens is we just don't eat foods with phenylalanine, and then we're not sick. So we've got two other diseases, and these are the ones you might want to spend the most time thinking an issue where your blood does not clot properly. And this is a sex-linked disorder. We talked about sex-linked being on the X chromosome. And the implication here is that it's going to affect males more often. Because males, remember, are XY. And so they only have one version of that gene. And they can't be a carrier because they can't ever hide that. If they have the recessive, then that is what they show. Females can be carriers because they get two versions. So they could have X big B and X little b. Here's the recessive. But they're not hemophiliacs because they have the normal version. And so hemophilia is where your blood doesn't clot properly and you can Ms. Valentine, please call the front office. Ms. Valentine, please call the front office. 
The last genetic disease that we want to talk about is another sex link disorder. It's also recessive, and it's called red-green color blindness. It mainly affects males. Females are the only types of carriers. And again, we see that we're going to be writing the letters on the X. So X big B, X little b, this would be a female carrier. And so they just can't distinguish between certain colors. They can still drive because they can actually see when each light is lit up. So those are the main genetic diseases. I know we went through kind of quickly, but feel free to go back and pause on the slide if you need more time to write. What I just want to do is introduce the assignment that you're going to be working on today. It's an assignment where you're going to look at each disease and assign the letters. And then you're going to be working on creating what we call pedigrees. And so I just need to introduce the pedigree. You should be able to assign letters, figure out genotypes, do the Punnett squares. But when you get to the pedigree, this is where this is new to you. And this is just kind of inquiry. You're just giving it a try. And all I want to do is kind of introduce how you make a pedigree. So let me show you a picture of a pedigree. Here's a picture of a pedigree. It's basically a family tree. We look at each generation. Generation, generation, generation. So this one has four generations. And we track the females and the males. So one thing we want to note on our paper is that in a pedigree, in a pedigree, the females are, are circles. The males are squares. And this is easy to remember. Females are curvy. So females get the circles. So when we go back here and we look at it again, we've got females and males. But some of these circles are filled in. We fill the circle in when the person has that disorder. So whatever that disorder is, their circle or square gets filled in if they have it. Now you notice, it's not just a bunch of circle and squares. They're actually connected to each other with lines. And so what we want to see is that um, when we have a woman and a man who have kids, we draw a line between them and then lines down to represent their kids. So this woman and this man have four kids. One, two, three, four. This girl isn't one of their kids. She's married to their son. So four kids, the son is married to this daughter. We notice that the two boys have whatever this disorder is. And so what you want to be able to do in your pedigree is draw the shapes, draw the lines, and show who has the disease by filling in their shape. And so in this example, we've got a man married to a woman, and they have how many kids? One, two, three kids. And then their son married a daughter. And so what else you can do is you put their name right near their shape. So this is John, and this is Jennifer. Neither of them have this disease. They have three kids. Their son, Jason, does have the disease. So your job now is to go back. And after you've worked all the rest of the problems, you want to be able to go back and use the names and who has it to draw some sort of pedigree. So showing the man and the woman, showing how many kids they have. Maybe they have four kids. Maybe one of their sons, maybe one of their, I'm sorry, daughters married a son, and maybe they have two kids, and then you're filling in the shapes of who has it. And you do need to put the names of whoever that shape represents. I didn't give you all the names, I just gave you the names of the people we're following. And so um, there is, there are two folders of answers to this so that you can look at it if you need a little help.